From the day that Ankit Ankitov was appointed as chief of the United Bathhouses, people stood outside his office waiting to make their appeals to him. Sometimes there was a long queue. Someone complaining about his boss. Another asking for a raise. Another wanting to change positions. Another wanting to study at the university. While another wanted to take a vacation at a health resort. Ankitov was new on the job. It was an important position with lots of responsibilities, but a very small staff to assist him. Many believed that Ankitov would not be able to handle the position, and some had even opposed his appointment. But when Ankitov heard such criticism, he said, Let them criticize me. Why should I care about such people, these dregs of capitalism? They want to continue their despicable work and are afraid that they're doomed to be wiped out. Just leave them to me. I'll get rid of them. The first thing he did after getting the job was to summon all the managers of the bathhouses and ask them to bring their personal files. Yes, yes sir, sir, they replied, and tried to pull up chairs for the meeting. Ah! But Ankitov would not allow them to sit. Yes, sir is not the same as here they are, sir. I need you to get your personal files and bring them to me now. But comrade Ankitov, if we leave, there won't be a meeting. Ankitov was a bit puzzled by this statement. Opening his arms as if to embrace someone or something, he spoke with a calm voice. Without a personal file, what's the use of a meeting, my son? Shouldn't I know with whom I'm speaking? So the managers got up and left Ankitov's office. They returned with their personal files. When all the files were on the desk, Ankitov said, Comrades, I want to get to know all of you. That's why I'm asking you to wait outside my office. I will have my secretary call you in shortly. He shut his door and began to page through the personal files, reading them slowly and haltingly. Hmm. Rusal Hadyev, born 1911, father, blacksmith. Ankitov underlined this word in red and put a question mark in the margin. The managers had waited for about an hour when Ankitov's secretary appeared and announced, Murad Akhmadov may go now. Mursal Hadiyev must go home and return with his father's certificate. All others, please come in. Neither Akhmadov nor Hadiyev understood. understood. Comrade, what are you telling me? L let me talk to him and, and see what he wants of me. What certificate? My father has been dead for more than 50 years. Even his bones have disintegrated by now. Why are you acting like such a simpleton? The chief doesn't want your father, literally. He just wants to know his profession. My dear, let him look at my documents. He was a blacksmith. All the information is right there, in my file. In order to get away from the complaints, the secretary returned to her desk. But the managers would not leave her alone. Finally, she cried in exasperation, write a letter. What kind of letter? Write us a letter so we can see what you want. We don't want anything. You tell us what you want from us. <laughs> they were given strict orders to prepare their personal files and to bring them back in three days. After the managers had gone, Hadiyev came in. Akitov's head was down, buried in the files he had so nicely arranged on his desk. He raised his head, and not seeing any certificate in Hadiyev's hand, he asked, what do you want? I don't want anything. According to your secretary, you wanted to question me about something. What is your name? Hadiev. Uh, you have written this in a rather vague manner. I read your file. I read it all very carefully. Yet I still don't know you very well. For instance, in one place you say your father was a blacksmith. There are many types of blacksmiths. What type? He was a blacksmith. He shod horses and oxen. The question is not about horses or oxen. The question is about their owners. Did your father shoe the animals of wealthy exploiters or those of the poor and helpless? <laughs> Whoever gave him money, he shot his animals. But surely, during the bourgeoisie period, when your father lived and worked, the landowners had more money than the poor. Of course, the landowners were wealthy. So, as you say, most of your father's earnings came from the exploiters. Isn't this so? What difference does it make? Just a moment. <laughs> Just a moment. Isn't this so? Isn't what so? Isn't it true that the landowners had more horses shot? It is true. That will do. You can go. I, I don't understand. Why are you so interested in my father's occupation as a blacksmith? Do you have an animal to be shot? Again, Ankitov did not raise his head from the papers. He placed his left thumb on the family name Hadiev and shook his right index finger at the man standing before him. You are not allowed to have the job. 
Take ten days at your own expense and clarify your parents' social position. Because the chief was so absorbed in personal files, application forms, resumes, character recommendations, investigations, explanations, and requests, he very likely did not hear Hadayev's last words as he left the office. And Yitzhak could hardly wait until he could get the chance to organize his files. He really believed that everything depended on these folders. Some days he would sit in his office from morning until late at night reading personal files, one by one like a delightful novel. He would arrange the folders according to the social positions of the owners. The folder of any person he disliked would go to the bottom of the pile, while the folder of the person he liked would be put on top. And Ankita would have conversations with his folders as if they were real human beings, or in his own words, workers. Someone overhearing him might think that Ankitab was dealing with five or six kindergarten children, taking their hands and putting one here, one child there, and still another on a chair. The real people, the bathhouse managers, cashiers, boiler attendants, and cleaners were mere shadows of their files. The neatness and accuracy of the file indicated the honesty and the integrity of the owner. If fired appeared in the margin, its owner would disappear like a phantom. On the contrary, the person who had accepted written in his file would be called to work that very day. If someone told the chief that one of his workers was ill and was in the hospital, Ankita would often refuse to believe the news. Ah, there is no mention of illness in his personal folder. I beg your pardon, but he is safe and sound and is doing a fine job. Sometimes he was so familiar with a particular folder that he would not even open it. He would simply look at the shelves and seeing the folder number in its right place. Mm, he's doing a fine job. Comrade Anketov, Kurbanale has been in the army for the last three months. He sent a letter from some far-off region, and I think he's presently working as a sanitation worker. Stupid. Can't you understand? Don't you see his personal file in front of your eyes? How could he go anywhere without it? If he had gone, his personal file would have gone with him to the appropriate place. Frustrated by such explanations, the secretary would walk out. It was as if whatever one did, whatever one believed, and whatever one thought immediately penetrated the personal file and remained there indelibly until the end of time. In order to evaluate someone's work, it was enough to bring that person's file to the chief, almost as if to the day of judgment. One day, in one of the meetings, Ankitov stood up and said, Comrades, we have a tradition here in the bathhouses which is really quite absurd. I'm referring to the complaints book. Every passersby stops and writes something in them. We don't know if he's a friend, an enemy, or if he's neutral. I propose that the person who files a complaint should first fill out a request form and have it certified by us. Otherwise, we should not allow his complaints. People write and write, and we don't know into which personal file you should place their complaint. Upon hearing this, Ankyatov's boss, the head of the municipal department, interrupted... Comrade Ankyatov, that's enough. Be sensible. It seems that you are having a hard time listening to the voices of the masses and learning their opinions. You must understand, the book of complaints is the voice of the people, our customers' opinions. The complaints are a permanent record. Ankitov blushed deeply and regretted what he had said. He asked for permission to speak. I have made a great mistake. Now I understand my mistake, and I fully accept it. But please, I beg you, don't write this incident in my personal file. <laughs> <laughs> then one day, the manager of bathhouse number 10 needed some workers. He wanted... A bath attendant for the women's section. A cashier. And two cleaning women. Since he knew Ankitov's style, the manager had already prepared the applicant's personal files, put them in a folder, and brought them to Ankitov. The applicants are at the door. Do you want to see them? <clears throat> what do I want to see them for? I'm not interested in what they look like. I thought you might want to talk to them. Ankitov slapped his large hand on the folder and said, Here are the files. I want to talk to these. One of the personal files belonged to Nuru Nurazadeh, a member of the Young Communist League, or Komsomol. And the manager wanted to employ him as a cashier. He had some experience in accounting, and in high school he had received excellent marks in mathematics. Another file belonged to Nisa, daughter of Kanber who had six years' experience in bathhouse number 11 in Tbilisi. She was very good, and the manager wanted to hire her as a bath attendant for the women's section. Sharabanu, an old woman, and her divorced daughter, Mazma, both wanted to be cleaning women. 
Ankutov took his red pen and wrote his comments in the margins. He rejected Masma, asking her to bring an official document about her relations with her ex-husband, but he employed Shara Banu. He was really pleased with the personal file and account of Nisa, daughter of Kanber, and became more impressed as he read. She's the daughter of a blacksmith. None of her relatives include any suspicious characters. She's a housewife and is enrolled in literacy classes. I need an employee with such a clean record. He made her a cashier. Instead of Nisa, he made Nuru the bath attendant of the women's section. He filed the files in different folders on the shelves and came back, rubbing his hands together in satisfaction. Anket Ankitov, Nisa, the daughter of Kanba, does not want to accept the cashier's position, and she has every right not to. She is illiterate, and she can barely add and subtract numbers. Who is she not to accept? Let me talk to her. He quickly picked up her folder and began to scold her. I really didn't expect this from you. Not from you! I had absolute trust in you, and that was why I appointed you to this position! Is this a joke? I call it nothing but a joke! Don't talk about such things! Now, get to work! He put the papers back in the folder and returned it to the shelves. Suddenly, the door opened and a teenage boy came in. Hello, are you Comrade Antipol? And what if I am? I have come to thank you. I am Nuru Nuruzadeh. You want to make me the attendant at the women's bath? <laughs> what do you mean, want? It's been two days since I appointed you. You should be working there by now. No, excuse me, but in order to take this job, I'd have to be out of my mind, just like you. <laughs> Outrage! Angutov stared at him, but he said nothing. He went to the shelves and removed the boy's personal file. Angrily, he opened the file and yelled, You're fired! Go wherever you want to go! <laughs> Nuru grabbed the folder from Angutov's hand. Angutov was taken aback. Oh, be careful, the papers might fall out! Let me see what you've written in my file. Nuru opened the folder and read Angutov's note. He burst out laughing. <laughs> Look at this idiot and his claims! Who are you to fire me, you fool? Saying this, he tore the chief's note into pieces right in front of him. <sighs> A sigh escaped Ankutov's lips as he fainted and collapsed on the floor in a heap. <laughs> dried up in meetings is rarely identified. He's the one dried up and mummified from meetings who's lost his zest for life. You know the type, even if you don't know his name. You know him well and often pass him in front of his office or on the stairs. He's the thin man leaning forward, taking long strides. Where is he rushing off to? Another meeting. Under his arm, his gray, worn-out attaché case full of papers and notes untidily thrown together. What are all those papers? Protocols! All his life, immersed in thought, frowning, head bent down, face clouded, unaware of the world, that's the way he goes about his business. For him, there is no difference between day and night, spring and fall, hot and cold, heaven and earth. None of them have any significance. One is amazed to see this sullen-looking man who is so distant from the sound of spring, the fragrance of flowers, the songs of birds, or of music and joy. He doesn't enjoy these things. Do you think this man, the incarnation of bureaucracy itself, will be different in his private family life? Or that when he comes home and takes off his hat and meets his wife and children, his personality changes? that a light brightens up on his face and a smile appears on his lips. If so, you're mistaken. No, he is a man of principle, steadfastness, and directness. His own family life is like a meeting. He emphatically believes that all of us have been created for meetings. Our heads were given us to make appointments, our fingers for writing regulations, our voices for making speeches, and our hands for applauding at meetings. <laughs> To him, the whole universe has been created as the result of an important meeting, and everything functions according to a single decree. If you don't believe it, look up at the sky. See how millions of stars are gathered around the moon who is chairing the meeting. For thousands of years, such a heated discussion has been going on in the sky, and occasionally its thunder-like sound is heard on Earth. Catch a glimpse of Dried Up conversing with his wife, Neiransa. 
Comrade Vedansa, it has been suggested that you wash my socks and hang them up to dry. When his wife doesn't answer, Dried Up gets up and taps the blunt end of his pencil on the table. Answer is requested, Comrade Vedansa. His not so easy life that was usually spent in meetings, appointments, and giving speeches was disrupted several times by his own family affairs. Let me explain. One evening, 18 years ago, when Dried Up returned from a meeting, he was surprised to find his wife not at home. He wondered, what meeting could she be attending at such a time of night? <laughs> a short while later, the neighbor's wife stopped by and congratulated. Brother Dried Up, good news. You have a beautiful daughter. Oh. Mehran Zahanan is in the hospital waiting for you. Was this necessary? Who directed this order? What will they say at work? Then they brought the baby home, all bundled up. Dried Up did not leave his world of papers and notes to look at the child. Maransa asked her husband to decide upon a good name. Dried Up took the matter to a meeting of his club. Many names were suggested, but he accepted none of them. Instead, he insisted on his own ideas. He suggested... Maruse. Which means written report. Are <laughs> <laughs> serious? You must be joking. Wouldn't that be ridiculous? <laughs> and that's how his daughter's name came to be Maruse. <laughs> and she grew up. She began to read. And eventually, that's what attracted her father's attention. Whenever Marutsai needed books or writing pads, Dried Up would observe all the formalities. First, his daughter would be required to write her father a request. Then the request would have to be sent to school to be approved by her teacher. After that, May Ranza, his wife, would have to sign it. Eventually, Dried Up would get around to buying the book or the pad from a shop. And when the girl grew up, Dried Up's problems multiplied. He would give the same answer to all her would-be suitors. Fill out a form. I'll look into it. The suitors on hearing this would disappear. Eventually, Asger, a taxi driver who was very sincere in his intentions towards Marutsa, refused to give up his pursuit. Meransa was happy about the prospect of having Asger as her son-in-law, so she tried to influence her husband. Dear, they're asking for the hand of Marutsa. Be more specific. Who wants her and under what condition? The driver, Asker. Where is his letter of request? <laughs> there is no letter. Uh, don't be ridiculous. If there is no request, no forms, and no guarantee, then why are you wasting my time? Uh, perhaps whenever you don't have any meetings, you could meet this man. He could come and talk with you. Asger? 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 His name is very old fashioned. Very old. Whoever wants to marry Marutse should have a name worthy of her. If you mention it to him, he'll change his name. I don't need him. If someone is interested in our daughter, he should send a resume and a photograph. I could get familiar with him, and then we could start to talk about it. But my dear driver, I said he should send his job description, and then we could talk about it. There is no need for further discussion. My answer said nothing further. Asger was told what Dried Up had said. He replied, If he wants my resume, let him go get him himself at my office. But I know an easier way, and we won't need to bother him needlessly. That evening, Dried Up was arranging his minutes and official reports. Meranza opened the closet door and was putting on some new clothes. When her husband looked up, he saw his wife in a rather happy and festive mood, quickly dressing. Dear, where are you going? Uh, nowhere. There's just a small meeting. Where is Marutse? Uh, she's at her own meeting, and she has sent you a note. Mayransa took a small envelope from under a book on the table and gave it to her husband. It seems that the kids have an appointment. Read and find out. Dear, Dear father, father, we have discussed this extensively. We have thought about it and talked it over. We didn't want to bother you, so we've gone to the notary. Tomorrow is our wedding day. It will be in the home of the bridegroom. If you have time after your meetings, please drop by. Your daughter, Marutse. <laughs> dried up, dried up even more. What? What? They issued a resolution without consulting me? Who certified this? You must certify it. But I haven't read his request or investigated his job. What? Without having 
having some discussion? How can I approve such a decision? I mean, what kind of insanity is this? Whether you approve or not is your problem. I will be at a scarce house for the wedding. Look after the house. Don't leave the doors and windows open. And with those words, she slammed the door and stormed out. For dried up, it was as if the whole house had begun to spin around him, and a millstone had been tied around his neck. During the summer, when Uncle Salmon worked in the vegetable beds, he would become breathless from the heat and would go to his hut to rest. When he would be walking down the road and he felt there was a need for shade, a quiet voice within him would say, Plant a tree here. Now, near Uncle Salmon's orchard, there was an underground spring called Sazbulaka, the singing spring. And during the hot summer, no traveler would pass by without drinking from the stream and washing his hands and face. Fields stretched out to the horizon from there, but as far as resting for a while, there was not even the shade of a stone. One day, Uncle Salman stood deep in thought on the road near Sazbunagi. The sun had risen high in the sky and shone bright on his bronze, shiny brow. As he raised his hand to shade his face from the sun, a thought suddenly passed through his mind. He looked down at the earth, as if looking for something that was lost. He walked back and forth along the road, his boots burrowing into the earth. The next morning before sunrise, Uncle Salmon dug a ditch in the same place. Soon after, he brought a willow sapling and planted it there. He put some bushes and thistles around it to protect it from the cattle. For five years, he did his utmost to take care of that tree. The lo young, lonely tree spread its branches. Its roots had already reached water. It drank the stream water and received light and warmth from the sun. It grew tall and spread its green foliage like clusters of beautiful white jasmine over the heads of the travelers. It cooled the dry desert-like air and its shade greeted the passers-by. Even people who didn't know about the stream would come and rest under the willow tree. Seeing this would gladden Uncle Salmon's heart, making him feel very proud, like a father who had raised a wonderful son. Whenever there were people under the tree, he pretended to be passing by so that he could find out what they were saying. He would linger there, hoping to overhear their conversation. He thought, I have to see if people appreciate the shade of this tree. I wonder what they're saying about it. One time, two men on horses stopped there. From their appearance, they looked like teachers or physicians. They seemed somewhat intellectual. <laughs> Uncle Solomon was very happy because he believed that they were the talkative type. Holding a spade in his hand, on the pretext of getting water from the side of the stream, Uncle Salmon moved closer to the riders and listened to them. The men fastened their horses to a bush and went down to the spring and drank from it. Then they went over to the green grass to lie down. One of the riders brought out a small box from his pocket and rolled a cigarette for himself. The other continued a discussion, which seemed to have been left unfinished from a while before. You don't, you're, you're mistaken. You don't know people. At a single glance, I know what kind of nest this bird comes from. I'm not going to be taken in by sweet talk. It seemed that the writers were arguing about something. One spoke. And the other answered. One proposed an idea. The other rejected it. Giving up hope of getting anything out of their discussion, Uncle Solomon returned to his hut disappointed and dejected. The second day, he listened to the remarks of a man from the city. The man, not accustomed to long walks, had become very tired and seemed to be lying there without moving or talking. After waiting a long time, Uncle Solomon wanted to leave, but the man from the city began to speak. What kind of thing is this, Uncle? W what did you say, my son? I mean, the man who planted this tree. I say, you son of a cursed father, you spent time and money. Why didn't you plant a fruit tree like a mulberry or a pear tree? Would that have been too much to ask? Uncle Salmon was hurt by the city man's words. He didn't answer at all, and he hung his head as he went back to his hut. The third day, a strong, muscular cart driver came to the shade. Knife in hand, he climbed the tree. Uncle Salmon came forward anxiously, but seeing that the carter was looking for a shaft for his cart, he became less anxious. My good man, if, if someone hadn't planted this tree, how would you find your shaft? 
damn the man who planted this. Couldn't he have planted something sturdier here, like an oak or an elm tree? How can you make a shaft out of this willow? I know it's useless, but what can I do? Nothing else is available. Uncle Solomon didn't answer him either. On the fourth day, during the heat of the day when one could hardly breathe, a group of farmhands came to Saz Bulate. They were working in a farm nearby and had come to eat lunch under the shade of the willow tree. As soon as they arrived, a big bag was opened. They brought out yogurt, and mixing it with the water from the stream made iron. They cut bread, cucumbers, and onions and prepared everything. Then, getting out their wooden spoons, they ate with great gusto. At first, Uncle Solomon wanted to invite them to have some fruits from his garden, but he decided to stand aside and listen to them. He said to himself, First, let's see if they appreciate good work. The farmhands packed up what was left, and putting their hands under their heads, lay down to rest. May you rest in peace, the man who planted this willow. In the midst of this wilderness, the shade of a willow tree is better than anything in the world. Blessed be the hands that planted it. Uncle Salmon could not contain himself any longer. Moving from his garden toward the willow tree, he said, Thanks all you young men who appreciate my work. The harvesters recognized that it was the man who had planted the willow. Uncle, please forgive me. A moment ago, thinking that you were dead, we asked for God's blessings upon your soul. Oh, oh my son, I don't mind. <laughs> blessings are necessary for the living as well. You know the value of my work and appreciate it. No blessing is better than this. Uncle Solomon pointed to the shade of the willow tree and poured out his heartfelt feelings. Many people have come here. Many people have sat here. Many people have even cursed the man who planted this tree. I've heard them with my own ears. They were only thinking of themselves. It takes all sorts of people to make the world. But I knew that people would come who would appreciate this shade and praise me for it. There are good people in the world. Now when I see you resting and taking about this place, I feel rewarded. I feel as if a new life has been given to me. It's as if I had paid my debt to the world. The goldsmith knows the value of gold. <coughs> we laborers appreciate your work. My son, I believe in good work. <laughs> a dog also leads a life. We humans should leave something, a good work or a trace of ourselves. You see down there, as far as you can see, orchards and gardens extend to the horizon. Our forefathers planted them. They sweated and prepared all of this for us. We have to do the same for our children. If everyone only thought of eating and enjoying himself, this world would be left in ruins in a few years. The farmhands all agreed with Uncle Solomon. As they got up to leave, the willow tree waved its young, green, clean leaves, and as if whispering in the breeze, it seemed to be saying, Yes, yes, yes. to Uncle Solomon's words. <laughs>